Pushkin. Welcome to Caveat. We have a very special show for you tonight. I'm Will Pearson, president of iHeart Podcast. We are proud to be partners with Pushkin on this very special podcast, What's Your Problem with Jacob Goldstein? So please join me in welcoming Jacob and Stacy to the stage. Women get a raw deal at work. Men make more money, men run almost all of the world's biggest companies, and men capture almost all of the dollars invested by venture capitalists. And yeah, I mean, sure, we should work to make the world more just, to bring these numbers closer to balance. But, but, while we are doing that work, women still have to go to work every day and, you know, try to get a raise, try to get promoted, try to get the things that we all want. So while we wait for the just world to arrive, it would be nice to have like a little help, you know, say a guidebook, a guidebook for how women can get ahead in the male dominated workplace. As it turns out, this book exists and it was written more than 500 years ago. I'm Jacob Goldstein, and this is What's Your Problem, live from Caveat on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. My guest today is Stacey Vanek-Smith. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Stacey is, you are... The global economics correspondent at NPR. You're my friend. We work together at Planet yes, Money. Yes. And most importantly for tonight's show, you're the author of the book Machiavelli for Women, Defend Your Worth, Grow Your Ambition, and Win the Workplace. Yes. Stacy, your problem as I have defined it is this. How can women get ahead in a workplace that is stacked against them? Yes, I would say that's a that's that's a great framing for the problem. That is that is it. Good. So what I want to do is I want to talk about your own career as you do in the book and how some of the larger problems facing women have come up in your own career and how if only you had known your Machiavelli, <laughs> he would have helped you solve those problems. Uh, but before we get to that, let's just like give me like a little hit of Machiavelli. Just give us the like kind of Machiavelli setup for the for the bigger story. Right. Well, I had read Machiavelli in college um, as part of like a political science overview class, and I had really hated the book terribly because it's very cynical. You know, Machiavelli does not think people are great. Machiavelli is a little bit cynical about who people are and the things that motivate them. Um, but, you know, I then I went to work in the workplace and I started thinking about Machiavelli more and more. And when I went back and revisited the book, the book was a little different than I'd remembered it. And the premise of the book is he's like, there are two kinds of princes, the prince, two kinds of princes, he's like they're the princes who inherit their kingdoms. And he's like, for them, it's pretty cushy. Things are pretty easy. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, that guy's in power. And then there are the conquering princes. And he's like, for the conquering princes, difficulties abound. They're new to this territory. Their power is being questioned constantly. Why is it them? Why not me? And I was like, that is actually a really good proxy for women and, uh, and people of color and other marginalized workers in the workplace because we're in the workplace, right? Like we, we but it, the difficulties abound. We're getting questioned and pushed back and all that stuff. So I actually thought it was a really beautiful approach it didn't seem cynical to me, per se. I mean, he is a little cynical about people, truly. But what interested me was that he, his whole idea is that you take, a, like, remove emotion from situations and approach everything logically. And I actually found that very, very helpful when approaching issues of unfairness in the workplace and, and the workplace in general, um, which can be kind of an emotional place, but I found it ver a very useful way to start and approach issues at work. Yeah. I mean, it seems like one of the things in your book and in, in Machiavelli is it's sort of the ugly truth, right? Like 
and and this comes through in the in the book in the things you recommend. I mean, as we'll get to, it's like it's not dealing with the world as we want it to be, right? And the solutions are not the kind of solutions we would want, right? It's 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 kind of grim, but maybe effective. Yes. Well, I started looking at a lot of of the research around this because I I'm a big homework person. I've always been good about doing homework. So when I would come up against issues in my job and my career, for instance, I I really don't like negotiating. So I would read books about how to negotiate. I would do homework. And then I would try the things in the books and they would not work. I'm one in one instance, it was like, you know, you need to talk yourself up. You need to go into your, you know, your review and basically kind of list off all of your accomplishments. And I did that and it didn't feel great, but I, you know, I did the thing because it was what the book said to do. And um, my, my manager's reaction was, wow, you certainly think a lot of yourself. And then I just spent the whole time trying not to cry and definitely didn't ask for a raise. I know it was it was it was rough. Um, but but I realized that a lot of the advice that should work and that should work. Right. It actually does work for men. If you look at there's a lot of research about this stuff, which was very, very helpful to me. Um, it does work for men. Uh, but if when women do it, it does tend to backfire because people have different expectations often when they're talking to different people. And so if you do one thing and I do another, the reaction is often going to be quite different. And so I wanted to acknowledge the reality of that. Is that OK? No, it's not OK. Like if you go in and list off your accomplishments and they're like, you know what, Jacob, you're right. Like you, you really have achieved a lot. And I go in and they're like, wow, you think a lot of yourself. That isn't OK, but it is the reality. So how should I deal with that, as you say, in a workplace where I want to raise and you know, maybe I'm not in a position to sort of change the whole structure of the workplace. So there's this uh, metaphor, really, that you use in the book to describe this double bind, basically, that women are in, right? Where uh, if you do things that would seem compelling in a man, you're looked down on. And if you don't, then you don't get the raise either. So it's sort of a lose-lose situation, right? And you call it the hot box. Yes. Which apparently is a different meaning where you grew up than where I grew up. Because... <laughs> Where I grew up, you know what I'm going to say? Where I grew up, hotboxing was smoking weed in the car with the windows up, which is not what you mean, right? No. In, in Boise, Idaho, your hometown, the hotbox is what? It is. A, it was like a t-ball term, like a baseball term. So what happened? A much was, more wholesome place to it grow was a up, very, apparently. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Um, but, but yeah, so I was on a t-ball team. I was really terrible at t-ball. But... Um, I would get a hit every once in a while, but it's a term for if you're caught between bases, essentially. So if you're like running between second and third base and the second baseman gets the ball and like basically they can throw it back and forth between second and third base and you're not out, you're in between the bases, but you're doomed. Yeah. It's not good. There's nowhere you can go. You There's swear. nowhere you can go. You're trapped. Okay. So that's the, that's I think the you metaphor. Said, did you say where you grew up? They called it a pickle. Yeah. They called it a pickle. It just it That's seems, delightful. It, it, like it applies as well, right? Yeah. So, so, so how does this map to women in the workplace? So what happens is when women get into leadership positions, they run into this issue where the p things that people like to see in leaders are people that don't care that much what other people think, people who are decisive, people who will speak up and take credit for their actions, people who are assertive and will push back. So those are the qualities people want to see in a leader. Those are things that inspire people when it comes to leaders. And those line up almost exactly with the qualities people also admire in men. The problem is when you are a woman and you do those things, the qualities that people associate with a quote unquote good woman, and those are things like nurturing, humble, compassionate, sympathetic, supportive. Those are all really beautiful qualities also, but you can't really use them in a leadership position all the time. So when women get into leadership positions, they're in a situation, the hot box, <laughs> the pickle, um, where if they sort of behave in, in traditionally more feminine ways, they are considered bad leaders, right? If you're compassionate and supportive and gentle and kind, uh, that doesn't work as a leader. But then when women will try to display more masculine traits, they will be very deeply disliked. Um, and you see this a lot of times with female politicians, like very kind of pronounced cases. So you end up in a situation where if you kind of can't win. So I feel like 
for me, this was like the really big central idea that I took from the book because uh, it just frames so much and it seems so pernicious. Uh, but then what I found really interesting was these ways you enumerate of not solving the larger problem, but dealing with it, right? Of how to live in this unjust world as a professional woman, basically. And so I thought we could walk through some of the moments from your career that you talk about in the book from before you had, you know, the wisdom of Machiavelli at your fingertips and sort of walk through what happened and then, you know, what would Machiavelli do, basically, or have done? Um, so there's one you talk about where it's relatively early in your career and you find out a male colleague with a similar job is making a lot more money than you. Like, tell me, tell me that one. Yes. So I found out, so this is when I had first become a reporter and I was very, very excited to become a reporter. I had been a producer and it can be kind of a hard jump to make, really wanted to make it. And I found out I was a reporter and shortly after that, um, a male colleague was promoted and he had, I think, four or five years less experience than I did. And I found out through a series of events that he was making $18,000 more a year than I was. And I just, the thing that kept going through my head is that's a car. That's a car. <laughs> it's He's a car making, every it's year. A car, it's a car a year. <laughs> and he gets a car and, and he gets so a car. <laughs> <laughs> it's like terrible. It's like it's reverse Oprah. Oprah. Reverse, yeah. like, so I was really beside myself. And I made an appointment with the boss. I forced myself. I mean, I was I was just, I was so embarrassed because I had actually really tried to negotiate my salary when I had gotten this, this title bump. And I had tried everything, all the things. And so I really thought that I'd gotten this great salary. And then I found out that this kid, <laughs> he wasn't really a kid, but <laughs> this, this person who had less experience than I was had just sort of, in my in my mind, waltzed in for like 20 grand more. And I was just devastated. So I walked into my to my boss's office and, you know, fuming and lay this out. And it's kind of like, you know, j'accuse. I was like, I know, like, I know what you're paying. And, and he was very, very shocked and rattled. And I remember this so clearly because he looked at me and was like, well, what do you want? And I had no idea. No idea. I didn't think at all before I went into his office. I was I was super upset, which I had every right to be. And I was really angry. And I didn't think of what I wanted. I just wanted to like confront him and be like, you are terrible and I am right. And that did happen. And I, when I first started reading Machiavelli, I brought my copy of The Prince for you. It's very beat up. Feel um, free to cite it. Yes, needed. I will. I will. He's he's quite eloquent. Um, but I remember just, I was like, oh my God. It was like one of those moments when I looked back and I was like, I had all this power in that moment. I had all oh. this knowledge. I had all this power. If I'd been more thoughtful about how to approach that moment, then I really could have used that moment in a way that would have I mean, I've, I did get a raise because of the sort of terrible confrontation, but I could have used it in a much more productive way. So you're still at that moment, you know, in the hot box, right? You're still living inside these world of these uh, gender expectations that yeah. sure. screw women at work, basically. So are there particular moves you could have made in that setting where you had power, where you had this moment when you could negotiate for more that would have sort of optimized it kind of in a Machiavellian way? Yeah. So what I wish I would have done is like think about it a little bit strategically. It's like, OK, well, I know that, you know, this Ralph is making twenty thousand dollars more than I am. So I also know that I have more experience so I can walk in and say, listen, you know, I was really, really excited to be promoted into the, this position. And you had, you know, I really appreciate that you you took this chance on me, and I know that's a big deal. Um, and I know that, you know, we weren't sure if, if it would work out, but I think I've been a really strong performer. Now that I have established myself in this job and this is a fair workplace, I know I think my salary really needs to be adjusted. Um, I know what this workplace tends to pay for the kind of work I'm doing. And at the level that I'm working, I think a salary of X would be more appropriate. What do you think? And I think that would have been way better than – what I did, which got me a rate, I didn't get all the way to match my male colleague's salary. I think I got like, I think I got a raise of like $10,000 or something like that. But I think I could have gotten more than $20,000 by kind of making a logical case. And I didn't. There are things you recommend in the book that you're not saying now 
And like, I don't know if it's because it's uncomfortable. Like you say in the book that in a negotiation like that, women should smile, which seems like a terrible That's thing. That's I'm true. not going to say I that. I don't like. It's in the book though. No, and like you're, you're saying That's all the true. nice things now because it's like, sure, but like, Let's like get get to the <laughs> gnarly Machiavellian part. Okay, the gnarly Machiavellian like, part. Like smile is like a terrible thing. You're not supposed to tell women yes. to smile, right? No, but that's it, what you say. No, okay, yeah. So it's like smile. Um, people tend to respond better to women in negotiations when they they bring up like a social connection. So it's like, oh hey, how's it going? How was your trip to Greece? Um, you smile. You don't. Uh, no adversarial behavior. You keep things very positive. People really like it when women are positive and supportive and express empathy. So it's like, oh, you know, I know, I, I totally understand that you're dealing with a, you know, a but like a really tight budget and that's really stressful. I totally get that, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and that I was reading all this stuff in these studies and I was like, oh my God. But I said, I remember I, Joan C. Williams wrote this great book, What Works for Women at Work. And she was expressing to me, we're talking about what to do if you're interrupted. And she was presenting like all these really terrible scenarios, like saying like, oh yeah, you know, Jacob, I, I really, you know, it, or if your ideas get stolen in a meeting. Um, but, you know, I was like, this is really awkward. That's awful. And she was like, no, it really is. And she's like, a lot of people, you know, don't want to look at this stuff. She's like, but you know, I don't necessarily want to smile. She was also talking about like wearing dresses more. One of the things she did was she would dress in a more feminine way. She said she was brought a lot of masculine energy to work. She was a lawyer and she said she learned she's, she wore more dresses. And I was like, that doesn't feel great. She's like, listen, you have to do what's right for you. But she's like, I think, you know, behaving as, you know, as if you're living in the world as it ought to be at great personal sacrifice and retiring with way less money than you should have. She's like, I can't support that. She's like, so at least she's like, I think you should be honest. And Machiavelli was very much all about that. He talks a lot about, you know, the way in which we live and the way we ought to live are things like so wide asunder is what he says. Um, but, you know, it's like the way that we should be and the way things are are not the same. And so you have to navigate which is different for everybody, obviously. But you have to navigate the situation. So yeah, the, your negotiation might go better if you smile more. Your negotiation might go better if you dress in a more corporate way. Your negotiation might go better if you emphasize your social connection with somebody. Your negotiation might go better if you're really understanding and express empathy for the issues that they might be dealing with. It's a little stomach turning, yes. But I did make a promise to myself that I would lay this stuff out and be honest and at least give people the tools so that they weren't doing what I was doing, which is reading all this advice and trying it and like having it totally backfire and be like, but I did the thing in the book. At least I was like, well, at least you give people options. So yeah, that is, that's the ugly truth. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, You're welcome. I understand how difficult it must be for you to ask these kinds of questions. <laughs> So I really wow, appreciate Stacey, that. I really like you. <laughs> um, we're going to take a quick break. If you're in the audience here, you can get a drink. If you're listening at home, you can have an ad. We're back live from Caveat in New York City. I want to do another kind of big idea and another story together, as we do, like a story and an idea. Yeah, yeah. And just to plant them together. Well, I'll say today at the office, somebody who's not here tonight, she couldn't come tonight, but she's like, oh my God, you're interviewing Stacey Vanek Smith. And then she showed me a picture on her phone of a page from your book. She liked it so much, she took a picture of it. Not, not enough to buy it, apparently, but enough to take a picture of it in the books. <laughs> she she said she put it on her Amazon wish list. Um, <laughs> halfway there. So the page was about um, something called the Cinderella syndrome, mm. or that you call the Cinderella syndrome, or that is called. And there's also a particular story in the book that I think, uh, from your own life, that kind of um, illuminates the syndrome. So the story from the book is when you're trying to get promoted from producer to reporter. So yeah. can you sort of tell that story and then talk about you know how it how it explains the Cinderella syndrome. Yes. And then maybe we can get to the Machiavellian solution. Yes, absolutely. So um, I was working as a producer at the time. Uh, I was an assistant producer, so I was starting out. And I really, really wanted to be on the air. It was the thing I had always – I wanted to be a reporter. And I would – 
I would report stories for the I was working at Marketplace at the time and I was working in the middle of the night. Uh, I was working the graveyard shift. So it was it was really rough hours, but I would stay up and I would report stories and I would kind of you could do little freelance stories if you were a producer. And so I was doing this quite regularly. And every time a reporter job came up, I would apply. And I applied to like six or seven of them over a period of four years. And I just never even got an interview, even though my work was on the air pretty regularly. So they had a feeling of what I could do. I wasn't totally unqualified to be applying. And I went to the my boss, like the head of the company. And I was like, yeah, I just... I just applied for like an eighth job and I'm just not, I'm not even getting interviews and, and I'm just wondering what's going on. And he was like, well, you know, we, these jobs are super competitive and you know, your stuff is solid, but it lacks specialness. And I was like, I still remember specialness cause that's not a word. Uh, <laughs> but I, so I, and I really internalized that. I was like, Oh, my, my stuff is not special enough. And of course, looking back at that through the lens of Machiavelli, I see it quite differently. But at the time, I just believed him. I was like, okay, he does not think my work is special enough. So I worked for like eight months and saved and saved and saved and saved money. And then I went in to quit my job. I was going to quit and I was going to be a radio freelancer, which I did. So I went in to quit the job. And in the meeting where I was quitting, he was like, well, uh, why don't we put you on a reporting contract? And I was like, well, wait, I don't know if you remember this, but, but I'm at not that special. Specialness? Yeah. Um, and I was, I was so puzzled and I was like, great, you know, I was thrilled. So I signed the contract. And of course, looking back, I was like, I was a producer in the middle of the night. That is a really hard job to fill. A reporting job is much easier to fill. If he hired me for a reporting job, he would be vacating a slot that was, it's for the morning show. So it's its a really, it's a hard job. It's a demanding job and it's a really hard job to fill. It was just making a problem for him. That is why he was like, that's why I wasn't getting interviews. It had nothing to do with my ability as a reporter. This happens, but this kind of thing actually happens to women, especially quite a bit. And so just what is the Cinderella syndrome? So that's the story. What's the Cinderella syndrome? So the Cinderella syndrome is from the Cinderella story. Um, and it, in the story, there's, you know, Cinderella's trying to go to the ball. And she asks the evil stepmother, like, I want to go to the ball. Can I go to the ball? And the evil stepmother's like, you can totally go to the ball. We just need you to, you know, clean the banister, sweep the chimney, all this stuff. And Cinderella's like, OK, I'm going to do it. And so she cleans the banister and sweeps the everything. And then she's like, can I go? And someone's was like, no. You don't you have specialness, Cinderella. You I'm sorry. Yeah. It just yeah. feels, you just don't, yeah, it just seems like ball material. Um, so, but, but how this relates is women will often get stuck in this situation. And whereas men will sometimes get promoted and often get promoted on their potential, uh, women will get promoted on the work that they've done and they'll be asked to prove themselves over and over and over again. And it just has to do with, again, unconscious biases and where people see certain things. It's like, you know, I think he might be a really good host, uh, which isn't necessarily going to occur for. And this also occur, happens with like people of color and other marginalized groups. It's just like they don't look like a host or people are just I don't know. It's my gut feeling. A lot of this stuff happens with gut feelings. So a lot of times, especially with women, they'll be asked to do you know, prove themselves over and over and over again, as I was proving myself over and over and over again, and get, getting told different things that are not necessarily true. Like, well, we'll you know, just put in a little more time, try to make your work a little more special. It had nothing to do with that. It was something else entirely. And yeah. So, okay. So that's the problem. What's the Machiavellian solution? Well, the Machiavellian solution, I think, in in my case, would have been to recognize that me leaving my job was going to make a problem. So to come to my boss with a solution and say, listen, you know, Neil over here, I know is really eager for a promotion. I think he'd be really great in this job. Why don't you put him in that job for six months? He would be great. He'd be trained up. He could fill in for me. And then I would, you know, get to be a reporter and just basically anticipate the problem, see it from his point of view and solve it while proposing the thing that I want. I think that, that would be- That one seems less unappealing than the other Machiavelli Not solutions. all the solutions are unappealing. That's true. They're most interesting when they're unappealing, They're right? most interesting like, when they're unappealing. Nice those, were really, there. There were, those were really, really hard ones to write. Some yeah. of them really were did, tough. Did people get mad at you for writing a book where you tell women to smile? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, some people were upset at some of the advice. I mean, not a lot of the advice is just more practical, like do a lot of research, find out what people in. You know, so a lot of it is is not stomach turny, but some of it, the most stomach turny, you'll really like this, Jacob, uh, was when I did the the motherhood chapter. This was probably the most surprising research I did in the book was the the penalty for motherhood, uh-huh. the discrimination that mothers experience. It is insane. The pay gap between women who have children and women who don't is bigger than the gender pay gap. Uh-huh. And uh-huh. women, when they when they would have identical resumes with like a, a woman's, you know, women's name and one of the resumes indicated children like PTA and special interests or something, uh, women would be recommended for lower salaries by 15 wow. percent. And w- the people would look at their resumes far more critically as far as um, and be much more inclined to impose harsher penalties for things like lateness. So automatically there's just a, a feeling of. Her real job isn't this job, is what comes up. And so, of course, what we want is to solve the underlying problem. It needs to be solved. We want that not to be a problem. But there's also this sort of in the meantime problem. What do we do about what do we do about it? Right. There are mothers every day trying to get a job, trying to get promoted. The world is still broken in this way. Like, what's the Machiavellian solution? (laughs) Machiavellian solution is I called everyone about this because I was like, I don't want to put this in the book. Uh, basically, it said, you know, before, you know, if you know your your before you have your baby, talk to your boss, make really concrete plans, basically act like you're going on vacation, even if you're not even sure you're going to come back or how you're going to deal with childcare. Just be like, OK, great. So I'll be back in April and I'll pick up this project right where I left off and just kind of don't let them what they call mommy track you. And it's a really real. I mean, the research is insane. The other thing was just. Oh, um, oh, Jacob. Uh, so you, you put it in the book. I know I did. I know. <laughs> um, but you are you basically don't talk about your baby. You come back to work, you just don't mention the baby. Like, don't show pictures. I mean, it's it's not pretty. And I really hated writing that because it's a beautiful thing. You've got a baby. You should shout it from the rooftops. That's wonderful. The circle of life. And yet um, people will use it as an excuse not to promote you, to pull you off important projects. And so, yeah, my two main pieces of advice from the research were really painful. It was basically don't talk about your baby and then work as if you do not have a baby, which it's really rough. Um, But I think it maybe highlights the gravity of the problem, too. How have people reacted to that part of the book? The people who have talked to me about it who have children have actually sort of agreed. I did have, actually, that's not entirely true. One woman was like, no, I brought my baby to work. She's like, nothing is going to change if people basically hide the fact they have children. She's like, your book is going to keep people back, like instead yeah. of sort of yeah. pushing the issue forward. And she made a really good point. And she had said she in her workplace had made a real point of bringing her baby to work. And eventually she'd even left her office because she said she'd still run into so many issues and start started her own business. Um, but she was like, nothing's going to change if. Yeah. And that so is, there is some that tension, is, right? Where if you like are tension. dealing, if you're just living in the bad in world, the you're not system. fighting to make it better. Yes. If you're navigating inside either. of a, but yeah. this is the, 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 this is the complication of yeah. living in a system that, as you said, in certain ways is broken, is that you have to work in it and try to change it. And that is enormously difficult. At the same time, you're just like trying to pay your gas bill, you know? So it's, it, there is, it is a painful thing. And I think it's a painful thing to experience and to talk about. There's a great, maybe the opposite of Machiavelli, but Eckhart Tolle has a, had this like piece of advice that I remember listening to. And I was like, that's very Machiavellian. Where he was like, there are three sane responses to a difficult situation. You change the situation. If you can't change the situation, you leave the situation. If you can't change or leave the situation, you accept the situation. I was like, that is actually very Machiavellian. It's like, this is the situation. What are you going to do? Like, what are the actions you can take? And what I really appreciated about Machiavelli was like ways forward. And I think I had sort of been spinning in the the outrage and the hurt and the shame and the unfairness and all that um, for a long time. And I think Machiavelli kind of showed me a way out. Coming up, the lightning round after this break. (laughs) 
Now, back to the show. Now it's time for the lightning round. Okay, all right. (laughs) (laughs) What happens in the lightning round? Do I... I ask you questions and you answer them. Quickly. But in rapid fashion. Okay, okay. I guess that's kind of in the title. What would Machiavelli think of Machiavelli for women? <laughs> um, I think he would be psyched that he was still being talked about. Oh, okay. um, Yeah, and I don't think he would care that, I don't think he would be like, well, I don't want women in power. I think he'd be like, great, they're talking about like and more people potentially buying my book. I think he would be excited. Um, that's a very Machiavellian response. Um, What's one thing a boss or manager can do to make the kinds of problems you talk about in the book a little better? Put like systems in place. I think, like I said, a lot of the gut feeling stuff is where a lot of these problems come in. So making kind of a system like, okay, when we're hiring for this position, we're going to like take names off resumes at first, or we're only going to look at candidates that have like X, Y, and Z, or we're not going to look at these things. Those things can kind of help avoid some of the, the biases that come up. Um, what's your favorite thing about Machiavelli, the the man, the person, not the writer? Hmm. I think what I loved about Machiavelli was when I started reading about his life, he actually wrote The Prince at a time when he lost everything that he had. He was a very impressive career. He was basically the secretary of state for Florence for a while. He was like met kings. and But then power changed hands and they like the new leader like took all his money away from him and put him in jail and tortured him and exiled him. And that was where he wrote The Prince. And I I mean, that's like a weird thing to have it be my favorite thing about oh Machiavelli. <laughs> but I think it it humanized him for me. Yeah, you describe The Prince as a as a cover letter, right? For, yeah. for a job. And he never got that job, right? He never sort of made it back to power. So he he failed, right? And I'm I'm curious, like, did he need Machiavelli for Machiavelli? <laughs> And if so, like, what would it say? I mean, he was in a situation, so he basically wrote The Prince. And in the beginning of The Prince, there's this weird apology treatise to the people who basically taken everything from him and tortured him. And he was like, oh, you're amazing. And here are just my my crappy ideas. But I'm just going to present you the very best things I've learned from all my millions of years of experience. Take it or leave it. It was Lorenzo de' Medici. Never even looked at it. Apparently never, never looked at it. And Machiavelli did not ever get back to sort of the the career that he had uh, or the life that he had. Um, I think the thing, the piece of advice that I would give him at that point, because then he did start like writing plays and poems and stuff. It was just to let go of that thing. I don't think he could have gotten back there. So I think I would have encouraged him to maybe let go of his old life and like maybe look for something new a little sooner. What's one piece of advice you'd give to someone trying to solve a hard problem? Maybe to get curious. I think that's the biggest lesson I've learned. So like instead of getting angry or afraid, which are kind of my two go-to responses in situations, especially if it feels like a lot at stake, to kind of just get curious and like explore a little. Because I think that can open your mind up and you can find solutions. So now that you've shown how useful Machiavelli is for women, what other domains should we be using Machiavelli in? <laughs> I mean, I don't think there's like a lack of Machiavellianness <laughs> in the world. Um, I know someone was like, are you going to do Machiavelli for babies? Because, <laughs> you know, in New York, you have to like, I don't know. Uh, I feel like babies are right super place. Machiavellian already. <laughs> yeah, they don't need true. a book. Yeah. Are, they're very good about that. Uh, who needs Machiavelli? I mean, maybe the climate needs Machiavelli. I think like some of the... Hmm, that's the, a good one. The, the things that are important but difficult to tackle, I think, are good. It's a good domain for Machiavelli. Stacey, that's the end of the lightning round. All right. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jacob. <laughs> Stacey Vanek Smith is the author of Machiavelli for Women. Defend your worth, grow your ambition, and win the workplace. Thanks very much to our sponsors, Geico and ZipRecruiter. Special thanks also to Robert Smith, the whole staff here at Caveat. Uh, Also to Edith Russolo, Carly Migliori, Nicole Morano, and Maggie Taylor at Pushkin. And at iHeart, thanks to Kathy Callahan, Maddie Ahrens, Will Pearson, Christine Flipsy, Jawara Parker, Allison Wright, 
Nathan Otoski and Connell Byrne. I'm Jacob Goldstein, and we'll be back next week with another episode of What's Your Problem?